Greetings from uh, Greenwich, Connecticut. My name is Jim Aiello of the Greenwich Economic Forum, and I want to thank the Financial Times for being a, a wonderful co-host on this digital dialogue event on the economics of, of uh, pandemics. We have Mohammed El Aryan and Max Bacchus, who are moderated by Jillian Tent of the Financial Times. Today, we have over 3,000 people who have registered for the event, and we're excited to have each and every one of you participating on this global dialogue on really the defining issue of our times right now, which is COVID and its impact on economics worldwide. I want to pay special thanks to our sponsor, which is Tian Fong Securities. Tian Fong is among the fastest growing financial services firm in all of China, and we're thrilled to have them as our sponsor. So without further ado, I want to pass this on to Jillian Ted of the FT. Jillian, take it away. Thank you very much indeed, Jim. And good morning to everybody who is watching from around the world, or good afternoon to any of you who are watching from Europe, or good evening if you're watching from Asia. And I certainly hope that some of you are, because we do have Ambassador Balkas, the former U.S. ambassador to China, with us. And, of course, one of the issues we're absolutely going to be discussing is the future of global trade and wither U.S.-China relations, which is a question top of the mind of many stock market investors right now. But the key issue we're looking at first and foremost today is whether the global economy at a time of pandemic and the tremendous shocks which COVID-19 has given to the global economy in the last few months. We've seen plenty of evidence of the dramatic slump that has been created by these shocks, in some ways quite deliberately by governments as they have shut down their economies but the critical question right now is where are we going in the future? And I can't imagine a better person to be debating this together with Ambassador Balkas than Mohammed El Aryan, who has been looking at the state of the global economy for a long time in a number of different roles, currently on the West Coast and also advising Allianz as their chief economic advisor. So we have two people with a fantastically global perspective. I can say that we've been honored to have both of them writing for the FT. Mohammed is a regular contributor to the FT. So you can look at some of his comments on the FT website as well. But I'd like to start off by asking you both. We had this morning, for those of you, anyone who's watching and doesn't know, doesn't read the FT, which if you don't read the FT, go and read it straight away. But we have a great piece in this morning's Financial Times and the very old fashioned crinkle paper part of the FT, which, as my daughter would say, is just so 20th century, but I still love it. Um, but we have a very, very important piece about, from the IMF saying, IMF lowers outlook and warns of public debt burden. It points out that although it came out a few months ago with a set of forecasts which were already bad, it now thinks it's going to be considerably worse than it previously expected. So I'd like to start by asking you both, um, for a moment, lots of discussion about whether we're going to have a U-shaped, a V-shaped, an L-shaped, a W-shaped recovery. What do you think? Let me start with Mohammed. So, so first, thank you very much for having me on. And it's a pleasure to be with Max um, on the same panel. Look, I, I don't like letters, but if you force me into letters, it would be a series of Ws. Um, I'd much prefer a square root sign which shows you a little bit the combination of an immediate V followed by a flattening out. And you really got that notion from the IMF projections. Uh, for the first time, in my view, in a long time, the IMF projections are actually quite realistic. And as you said, they involved a major, major revision um, in the global growth rate. We are in June, and the IMF revised down global growth projection from a minus 3%, a 3% contraction to minus 4.9. That's a massive revision for a current fiscal year. And it shows you the depth of the hit. And what it also revised down is the recovery next year. So consistent with this more V-shaped, we come back intra-quarter, but we flatten out and we improve at a lower rate. 
So essentially, you could say it's almost like a Nike swoosh or a square root sign, or as I discovered many years ago, the way that you write bank, the word bank in shorthand, which I was taught as an old fashioned journalist, looks like a Nike swoosh. Is that a fair summary of what you think is going to happen? It is. Um, it, it is a check mark. And I must say that this is the central scenario. We can talk about the upside, which has to do with policies and the downside that has to do with the market accident. But that is the central scenario. And it involves, importantly, a repeat of 2008, where we win the war against a global depression, but we do not secure a lasting piece of high and inclusive growth. Right. Um, Ambassador Balkas, would you agree? Basically, yes. Um, it, it, it somewhat depends on which countries we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, because uh, in China, it looks like it's a, it's a classic V. Uh, Chinese economy is bouncing back. That's my Chinese friends tell me. It's, uh, they're not very worried. And those who've analyzed the Chinese economy uh, tend to confirm that. In the United States, um, it's clearly not going to be a V. It's going to be square root sign, something like that. Uh, but it obviously depends on the on U.S., Um, see much greater increase in COVID. And they're going to add a lot more to their debt. It's going to be quite a lot of problems in those countries. And it also, as, as Mohammed says, it somewhat depends on, on the market response, the fiscal response in the United States, as well as the monetary response in the United States. Um, I, as Congress, I think, will enact another stimulus bill uh, this summer, the nature of between one, one and a half trillion somewhat similar to um in, in, in concept to the last but if if and then and then there's and muhammad could speak to this he's much more an expert than i about monetary policy um because the fed clearly has juiced up the most central banks around the world <laughs> literally juiced up the, the economy and, and caused the stock market to go up but it's it's going to be a v in some countries um, in the united states it's more like a swoosh or um like a square root sign we're not going to come all the way back very quickly Right, right. Well, I want to talk both about monetary policy and about fiscal policy um, and also further on about trade shocks. But perhaps I can start on the monetary policy issue with Mohammed because you wrote a masterful book recently called, or a couple of years ago, called The Only Game in Town because before COVID, everyone was already pretty stunned by the degree to which the central banks seemed to be single-handedly propping up the world economy. Post-COVID, anything we thought was remarkable then looks almost like child's play. Where do you see central bank policy going? And I'm going to have to apologize quickly to the audience. Um, as you speak, I'm going to have to quickly pop out a screen for a second to go and pick up a new charger for my computer because it's not actually charging right now. So part of the innovation and improvisation economy is learning how to cope with computers. And so if I vanish from the screen, I can hear you. I'll be back in two seconds. So, Mohammed, tell us about central banking policy. So what they've done so far in this crisis far exceeds what they did for the 08 global financial crisis and has been absolutely astounding. Uh, not just in scale, just to give you numbers, we got post-global financial crisis to about four trillion in terms of balance sheet. We now at seven on our way to 10. And we got to seven in about six weeks, but also how they've done it. Um, you know, those of us who are, who are somewhat purists when it comes to central banks would have never conceived the notion of a central buy, bank buying junk bond, exposing itself to default risk. Well, the Federal Reserve has done so. So it really has been an enormous intervention and the, the good, bad, and ugly to it. The good is that it reopened markets and it dealt with market malfunction. And as a result, companies have been, issue, has been, have been able to issue a significant amount of bonds, record level of bonds, in a world in which default rates are going up. That normally doesn't happen. But there's a sense that you're protected by the central bank umbrella. 
The bad is that once again, they are carrying the burden of the adjustment and using a very ineffective policy tool when it comes to the real economy. So they have inadvertently disconnected markets from the real economy. And that causes worries down the road, but also is politically very sensitive. It is the old, once again, Wall Street's benefit, but Main Street doesn't. The bad is that the ugly is what I call the no exit policy paradigm. And we saw that from 2008. It's not easy to exit once you do that. The, the ECB has found it almost impossible to exit negative interest rates. And the trouble with being so interventionist in market is you destroy the price signaling of markets and you destroy and distort the role that markets play in allocating resources and mobilizing savings. So you do pay in terms of a risk of future financial instability and in terms of zombie markets and zombie companies, which means lower productivity. Right. I should say, by the way, that um, anyone in the audience who wants to ask questions, please do go ahead. We have a Q&A function um, on the screen. And I can see that we already have a hyperactively engaged audience who are responding to what you're saying. In the first few minutes, we've already had about 16 questions. So I'm going to start picking up some of the questions quite soon and weaving them in. But um, Ambassador Balkas, do you have any views on monetary policy? Or can I turn instead to fiscal policy, which since you served for more than 30 years in, in the Senate, it's probably an issue you can illuminate to us in great detail. Oh, well, I, I frank, frankly tend to agree with Mohammed. Um, and even uh, Fed Chairman Powell has said, uh, and I've, all the central bankers, at least, at least in the U.S. I've talked to in previous years, Ben Bernanke especially, are very upset, frankly, that Congress doesn't act more responsibly and address some of the economic problems fiscally rather than the central bankers can somewhat do it themselves. Um, I think uh, it's, it's, it's very concerning, this huge pile up in debt. But the question I have is, what's the alternative? Um, not um, engage in, 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 um, in um, quantitative easing. Um, and if we don't, then what would the consequence be? Ever? Anything we do has, that we decide not to do has to is in the alternative. If we don't do this, what do we do? And um, it's the major weight of economic opinion, in, I think, in the world, certainly in the United States, is that uh, with the virus um, damaging the economy so much, we have no choice but to go big. Um, and it's, 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 a, it's a general Powell doctrine um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in Iraq. You just, you just go big. Um, and if that gives confidence to markets that I totally agree with Mohammed. There's a big disconnect between um, the markets, stock markets, and, and the real economy. And, uh, and but the alternative is is not to go big uh, on Fed policy. And I'm not sure what those consequences would be. Right. Um, can I perhaps ask? I mean, Ambassador Balkas, do you expect there to be more fiscal support packages coming down the tracks from Congress, given all the years he spent there? And you knowing how the sausage is made, um, do you think that it looks like the way, way is being paved for a new support package? Um, and do you think the current fact we're getting more outbreaks of cases coming through is going to actually increase the likelihood of support packages? Well, I have two questions. One is uh, before the election, and the other is after the election in the US. Uh, before the election, I, members of Congress, many of them, obviously want to get reelected. They want to do what they think the people back home want, and people back home want to have their incomes propped up, not reduced. It's the old thing between the concrete and the abstract. Uh, in the concrete, yeah, I don't want my taxes raised. Um, I want benefits. Now, now that may add to that, but that's an abstraction. That's long term. People tend not to be too conservative with abstractions, they're more concerned with concrete. So I, I think post uh, prior to the election, you'll see um, a, a new package somewhere in the neighborhood of one to five a trillion patterned somewhat after the uh, along the same vein as the other um, uh, 
CARES package and other measures Congress has passed. It's going to be a tug of war between, on the one hand, um, Speaker Pelosi would, would like about a $3 trillion package, and a lot of Republicans who say, oh, no, that's, that's a little too much. The people are hurting a little bit, so maybe we'll compromise at about 1 or 1.5. There is a growing concern in the Congress about the debt. It's starting to rise up, but no pun here. I think that the, the greater concern about um, people's jobs and health care is going to trump concerns about the debt. Now, next year, uh, if Biden's elected president, uh, for the sake of discussion, he will um, prob probably propose infrastructure policies that are paid for, because um, he'll be quite concerned about, about uh, increasing debt even more than it already has. So, Mohammed, the debt, um, how sustainable is it in your view? Are we heading towards a massive debt crisis? Um, I can see the question still pouring in. So you're silly, clearly saying something provocative or everyone's looking for guidance and wisdom from you. But um, I'll turn to the questions in a few moments. But Mohammed, you know, should we be worrying about a debt crisis as some of the Republicans are starting to do? So, so it is tempting to worry about debt crises because we are creating debt at an incredible rate. Uh, Max just said one to three trillion. Just to put it into context, that's five to 15 percent of GDP. And we've already created 15 percent of GDP with the first um, relief package, which was about relief, not about stimulus. So I understand the concern about debt. Um, but let's understand how this debt is being issued. It's basically being bought by the, the Federal Reserve. So its impact on the economy is not as much as it would be in, for example, a developing country where you don't have this flexibility. Having said that, the reason why we worry about debt is not because of the debt itself, but because of financial viability. And as any individual knows, that is a function not only of how much debt you have, but how much income do you generate. So when you look at viability, you have to have the numerator is debt, but the denominator is your, your ability to create income, GDP growth. And the main concern about what's going on here is that none of the money that's being created right now is about generating economic growth. None of it's about promoting productivity. None of it is to support infrastructure, labor retraining, labor retooling, all we need to make sure that we come out without low growth prospects. It's all about relief. And there's good reason to do it. But if we don't transition pretty quickly to promoting productivity and growth, then we're going to have the worst of all worlds. And the IMF has been warning about this, which is much higher debt and much lower growth. Now, go to developing countries. That becomes a real problem that, as my colleagues um, at Gramercy like to, like to say, it threatens a paradigm of non-payment. It threatens a paradigm of lots of debt restructurings, if not outright confiscation. So it depends where you're looking at. But the key issue is not just to look at the debt, but to look also as to whether the debt is supporting growth measures that promote productivity. Well, that's a great point. And I guess the answer for the most part is almost certainly no. We've seen very little sign um, that there's actually investment in potentially productive activity. I mean, we are starting to get the Trump administration saying they want to do infrastructure investment. Um, when I was um, with people in the White House earlier this year, they were saying they wanted to put the infrastructure bill finally on the table properly. Ambassador Baucus, do you expect to see infrastructure actually happening anytime soon? No. Nope. Right, well, <laughs> that was a wonderfully clear answer. <laughs> no, not so, this year. Not this year. It's, Congress is way too partisan. Um, there's just not enough cooperation between the parties, between the president and the Congress. Um, and it's, it's, it's not this year, no. Right. So let me ask another question then, Ambassador Baucus, which is, are you concerned that when the Chinese look at the debt pile that is being amassed in America, are they going to stop buying U.S. Treasuries anytime soon? I don't think so. 
No, I don't think so. Um, China um, very much is, is obsessed with stability. Um, it's, it, many people don't think you know, moves too much one direction or another, but essentially the, the country and even more especially the Communist Party wants stability. And they want to take care of the people, they want to keep the people happy, they want to keep the economy happy. And it made it keep, make, make sure that people are happy and get jobs. So I, I think that the, if China were to engage in that practice, it caused lots of, at least international market stability, maybe even currency instability. And I, I highly doubt that the, the Chinese government is going to pursue that course. Right. Um, Mohammed, um, are you concerned about a wider buyer strike towards U.S. Treasuries that we might see um, investors, if not in China, then elsewhere saying, we're looking at the trajectory of America where all this money is being spent in potentially non-productive ways, debt gets bigger and bigger. It could be time to shy away from the idea the Treasuries market is the ultimate safe haven. Not in the next few years, um, and that for two reasons. One is what's known as the dirty shirt analogy. Um, <laughs> You know, and, and, and the analogy comes, you're on a business trip, it suddenly gets extended, you can't get something laundered, um, but you've got to go up to a meeting. What are you going to do? You're going to go and wear your least dirty blouse or shirt. Um, you have no choice. And investors have no choice. Right now, the U.S. actually, the U.S. Treasury market is the most attractive Treasury market out there. Um, not only... Is it supported by by a 20 trillion economy? But importantly, unlike Europe, it offers positive rates. And the second reason why it's not going to happen anytime soon is that you cannot replace something with nothing. Um, if you exit treasuries, there is no other liquid instrument that can absorb the amount of savings that are in treasuries right now. So I don't see it as an issue in the next few years. Um, there are other things to worry about. But that one is not one I would worry about. And I'm a worrier by nature, so, but I don't worry about this one. Right. Well, we have so many amazing questions pouring in that I'm actually going to um, rip up the normal schedule and go to the audience and bring in some of these questions because they are absolutely on the hot button issues. And I think it's very, very interesting to hear the answers. Um, so I'm going to start with a question from Iris Young from City Capital who says that, to what extent do you think the trade tension between the U.S. and China will decelerate the pace of recovery between the two countries? Um, if so, do you think we're going to have more stimulus measures on the table? Um, and that is about us. Perhaps you can try and make sense for us about what on earth is happening in the U.S.-China trade war. Um, well, no, phase one um was a good beginning to try to get some reduction tension um, on the tariffs between the two countries the trouble is that COVID hit china after phase one was uh, was agreed to and that's very much undermined the, obviously the chinese economy so it's difficult for china to, to agree to buy i forgot the amount um of products agriculture products, manufacturing, energy products that they promised. It's going to be very difficult. Um, however, the Chinese government has said that they, they plan to go ahead and buy what they agreed to under, under phase one. Um, I, I think um, that uh, national security concerns about China, as Huawei, uh, ZTE, for example, are uh, tend to make it uh, difficult for America to to want to engage more even on a trade level with China. But I only tend to. Essentially, um, I think that we uh, under overlook the value and the amount of trade that goes on between the U.S. and China. It's not as much in the news, but it's there. Um, you know, rather, the, the top line is, is political. We, we, in the papers, we read about the political problems, but we don't really uh, know as much about the economic and the trade, whether it's in trade in goods, services, or investment uh, that is, is, is proceeding. 
China um, is bending over backwards to attract more um, U.S. and other countries' uh, foreign investment into China. Um, and they're making some efforts too, to relax some of the restrictions. For example, the equity caps uh, in many areas, um, an ownership, a foreign ownership in China have been eliminated. Financial services and some, and some autos and others. So China is working hard to, to keep the, the trade the, uh, in the goods and services as well, investment open, even though the Chinese are not investing in the U.S. now, but they certainly want the U.S. to invest in China. Right. Mohammed, how do you see the U.S.-China trade war playing out, particularly given where you're sitting right now on the West Coast? So only a fool would disagree with Max. So I am a fool. Um, I'm <laughs> somewhat less constructive than Max is, both on the relationship between China and the U.S. and therefore on China's economic prospects. On the relationship, we have now entered a period of deglobalization. And unlike the previous two shocks to globalization, 2010, when it was the household sector pushing back against globalization, because certain segments were alienated and marginalized, and the answer was inclusive globalization, inclusive capitalism. And 2017-18 was a government-led deglobalization shock with the trade war. This one, all three sectors in the U.S. will push for deglobalization. And that is why Democrats and Republicans agree on China more than they agree on other, any other issue. It will be companies who are going to be, to some extent, reshoring re the supply chains, mostly voluntarily, but in pharmaceutical, they will be encouraged by governments, same in technology. Second, it will be a blame game that's not going away anytime soon between the U.S. and China that will also have national security aspects to it. And then it will be the household sector. I don't see the U.S. unemployment coming any, well below 10 percent by year end. So there will be pushback against globalization. So I think that we have entered a period where U.S.-China relationships will remain tense and will be at the heart of a deglobalization process. And that's why I'm, I'm less constructive also on the Chinese recovery. China still needs the global economy. China still needs global growth. It is evolving its growth model, but not as fast as the extent to which the globe is going from being a tailwind to its development process to being a headwind. And that's particularly challenging when you're trying to avoid the middle income trap. I might say, if I could, yeah, I, I, you know, I forgot to mention the points that Mohammed raised because I agree with them. The one big one is, is deglobalization. I think it's, it's, it's frightening. The degree to which the United States, China, the world is deglobalizing. I think it's a big mistake. It's happening because we're fearful, uh, partly because of COVID. Uh, probably because of national security reasons. Um, and I think, frankly, the Internet and social media tends to cause some of this. That's another subject. Nevertheless, it's happening. Um, and, um, it's, it's, and, and supply chains are getting uh, modified um, in various ways. This is, a, this, is, this is all having a profound change, COVID and the U.S.-China tension, um, on our lives and on, on incomes of, of of individuals and business. I will say, however, that I'm, I'm a little more um, sanguine about the Chinese recovery. The Chinese are tough. Uh, that's one thing that struck me when I lived over there for several years. They're very tough. They, many have been through the Cultural Revolution, not their parents, their grandparents, through the Cultural Revolution um, or the Great Leap Forward, where tens of millions died of starvation. They're tough. And, they, they, they're, and, and they're going to work hard. I found the Chinese to be very practical, very pragmatic, um, looking for solutions, um, and more optimistic about their future than Americans are about theirs. It's, um, and they feel the winds at their back. There's nationalism is growing. And, it's, and as you know, and there's this saying, because during the Great Leap Forward, people had to eat roots. They ate bitter. <laughs> and it's they're tough. And if... They, that, that some of that's passed down to their kids and their grandkids. So my judge, my bottom line is China will find a way to keep going. 
Um, they're very tough. They're paranoid about um, running the country as well as they possibly can. Look at the Belt and Road Initiative, what they're doing around the world. Um, you know, they're doing deals in Europe, as I'm sure you know. Um, they're, they're tough. It'll be tough. Chinese will have a hard time, but they're going to do okay. So, Ambassador Baucus, while we're on the topic of China, we have another great question um, from Chip Bailey, who asks, um, maybe, what are, sorry, what's to ask, what are your views of the relationship between China and Hong Kong? Do you think that the West is going to back away from Hong Kong? Yes. Right. <laughs> Would you like to expand on that? Um, um, well, a lot of it's, you know, the power of proximity. China is there, right next to Hong Kong. Add to that, you know, the handover. And as you know, in 2047, um, Hong Kong reverts totally to China. We're facing a little bit, of, you know, like a stock market ex uh, phenomenon, a discount to the present. Um, one day, Hong Kong is going to be. Chinese, so it already somewhat is because we're anticipating that happening. Um, and at more important, frankly, is um, Hong Kong is neurotic to President Xi Jinping. Um, he'll do anything. Hong Kong can think... Chinese as quickly as he can, although he knows he can't do too quickly. And one final point here I don't see what leverage. Uh, that the U.S. has on Hong Kong, or that Europe has on Hong Kong. Different pain will tolerate pain. So and all I'm saying is, slowly, slowly, Hong Kong's going to move a bit in the Chinese orbit, but China's going to do, be, be careful about it and not move too fast. Wow. Well, I'm going to turn to a few of the questions which are more in Mohammed's side which is on the issue of monetary policy and where the economy is going. And I'd like to start by asking a question from Peter Balthus, which says, maybe it's one good one for Mohammed, which is more likely, further down the tracks, inflation or deflation? That is one of the toughest questions um, because of the demand side. So on the supply side, if you were just looking at the supply side, you would say unambiguously inflation. Because the period of disinflation that came from what I call the Amazon, Google, um, Uber effects that basically eroded pricing power um, is going to be counted in a serious way by deglobalization, by increased industrial concentration, and by lower productivity. So if you had to make a judgment just on the supply side, you, you, I would say inflation. The trouble is the demand side. We do not know what the demand side will look like coming out of this crisis because it depends on the length of the journey. And by the length of the journey, I mean this pendulum um, period of living with COVID, where we try to reopen, then we get health issues, then we try to reopen differently. Um, we don't know to what extent that's going to erode consumer sentiment because it increases economic household insecurity. I tell you, in the United States, um, if you are to go or talk to people at food banks, they'll tell you they have people in line every single day that they've never seen before. And the example that was given to me was a baggage handler from the local airport here. He had never anticipated losing his job. And he has no savings to speak of. So the shock to his household income was catastrophic. Unimaginable, but catastrophic. When, when he gets his job back, will he still consume the same or will he save more? There's also examples of, of, of lots of people who were in other service jobs, restaurants, etc., that are being hit very hard. So there is real question mark among economists as to what happened to the demand side. And unless you can answer that with confidence, you cannot answer your question. 
If you put a gun to my head, I would tell you we're more likely to go to inflation than deflation. But my level of conviction is not as high as I would like it to be because I cannot predict the demand side. Ambassador Bikers, do you have a view on that? I um, agree. My main concern is Mohammed's last point. Uh, people don't have jobs. Uh, they're not being hired back quickly. They're scared about the COVID phenomenon. They may not be spending as much as they otherwise would. Um, and so demand may not come back, um, which obviously means that with, with all the excess supply, we could get a little more inflation. I, I think this COVID is so endemic. I mean, it's, it's like smallpox. It's like chickenpox. It's worldwide. We're going to be living with it until we get a vaccine or there's some kind of herd immunity. It's, but it'll, really, it's going to be with us until we get a, a vaccine that, that works. There'll probably be different, very different vaccines. But the effect on the economy is, I think, almost too difficult to fathom at this point. And we're going to have to be wise and, and watch how it's developing and do our best as we move along here. Um, and hopefully get, we'll get through it by sometime, maybe middle, end of next year. Right. Um, well, we, this leads nicely into another next question from Robin Yang, which is that if there is no exit for quantitative easing, does the market go up forever or do we end up in a Japan situation? Are we heading for Japanification, if you like? Mohammed, do you want to take that one? Yeah. Um, first of all, we are, ha we are heading towards ja Japanification. Um, which means more and more involvement of central banks in the pricing of markets. Um, there is a significant probability that the Fed may be tempted into what's called yield curve control. And if Ambassador Park is, is correct, and I tend to agree with him, that this is not a one-off shock, that this is a long-lasting shock, um, then it's the significant probability that we may end up with that. So yes, we'll end up there. Can the market go up forever? The one thing central banks cannot protect investors from is capital impairment, bankruptcies. And when bankruptcies occur, there will be losses. So your question really is a judgment as to how many bankruptcies do we have in the next few weeks and months. Um, my own view is that the market has gone overboard. If you think the Fed provides you an umbrella, if you're under the umbrella, you're okay, but the market has assumed that this umbrella expands forever and it therefore has taken risk on the side. I'll give you an example. Look at where emerging markets are trading. Do you really think the Fed is gonna save emerging markets? It's not, but, the, but in the search for higher, ever higher returns, the investors have assumed this umbrella is almost infinitely expandable. It is not. And, and even the existing umbrellas may have holes in it. So, so be careful if Ambassador Bach is, is correct, and that's what a square root recovery looks like, then we will have more bankruptcy. We will have more capital impairment. We will have a paradigm of non-payment in certain places. And that is something that central banks cannot protect investors from. Right. Um, I used to joke after the 2008 financial crisis that we'd gone from a world where the financial system was hooked on heroin in the sense of all the credit creation that went with the credit bubble, all the CDOs and things like that. And it went from being hooked on heroin to being essentially put on to um, – methadone as a kind of you know substitute drug by central banks as they provide all the central bank money and i can't help thinking that what we're seeing now is the whole system going on to opiates instead or opioids um as a kind of you know substitute for that as the whole thing gets ramped up with ever higher and higher doses and the numbers yeah. are just extraordinary aren't they they are and, and 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 the worst thing is that the market has been conditioned not only to expect more and more support but feels entitled to more and more support because th the markets feel they're holding central bank hostage because they understand that the last thing central banks want, want to be responsible for is a financial instability that then undermines the real economy. So it's, it's, it's much worse than simply being hooked. 
you feel entitled to getting more and more doses of whatever you're hooked on. Right. right. Which, which, and for me, frankly, that it's a, that's the best example of failure of leadership um, in, in the Congress, in the, in the business community at all. Um, is the answers to all our problems have to be much more fiscal than monetary. Monetary is a short term, you know, give us a high. But uh, until our presidents, our prime ministers, and, and leaders in business and labor and those who make decisions, you know, act more like adults, um, you know, and with a head screwed on straight and their feet firmly planted on the ground and start working together, um, until that happens, I think this phenomenon you and Mohammed just discussed is going to continue. If we need leadership. So can I ask you, um, Ambassador Balkas, you know, if you were running America today or running Congress, what do you think would look like leadership in practical terms? What, I mean, how would you say design a stimulus package? Well, that's a big question. I would um, <laughs> do two things. Once uh, foreign, once domestic, um, but it, it, essentially, I get some pretty smart people. And by, by smart, I mean who are wise as well as, as technically smart, and we start putting a plan together. At the same time, I would um, work very hard to build bridges. I would work with um, the leadership of, the, of both political parties, um, with business, with labor, all the big players. And I make and I find a solution where we both tend to win, or at least we both tend to do better. And uh, I, I think, and it would take a lot of work, a lot of time, and it would be a significant infrastructure bill for jobs. It would be paid for, paid for by some increases in, in taxes, especially on the on the most wealthy. Um, and I would go to the captain of the and say, hey, you, you you've got to join in with us here. Because you have to join with, in with us. Uh, corporate taxes might have to go up a little bit. Um, um, well, not wealth tax, but wealthy have to pay a little more, and then so we can put together a package and get more control um, over over our economy. Something along those lines. Well, I must say that you know my strong impression from talking to CEOs recently, and I've spoken to a number in recent days, is that many of them are willing to join some kind of plan of national unity either because they're terrified about the pitchfork, pitchfork factor that's going to be coming yeah. down the track soon and the level of protest we've seen recently. And I'm talking from my yes. house, in, of my home in New York, Manhattan, and I've been kept awake the last few nights because there have been protests literally outside my window um, on a large scale, and the windows around me are being boarded up because of protests. Um, so the pitchfork factor is playing in, but also just a recognition, even amongst you know the wealthy families and even amongst you know, the corporate leaders that they've had a very beneficial tax regime in recent years and that that probably needs to be addressed. But I'm curious, Mohammed, do you think that um, there is going to be an appetite for serious fiscal reform coming down the tracks in the coming years? I sure hope so, because otherwise um, we, we are going to be in deep trouble. Um, you can't do it just through fiscal spending. You've got to do fiscal reform. You've got to change incentives in a pro-growth fashion. I love the list that Max set out. I would add a couple of things. Stronger safety nets. If you're going to counter household economic insecurity, you need stronger safety nets. And better global coordination. Um, it is shocking to me that you have a global crisis, and yet we have the lowest level of global policy discussions, let alone coordination, that I have seen in my career. Um, the public-private partnership are really important, and they're just one of the silver linings of this crisis. And I keep a list on my, on my desk of the silver linings, the things that you want to bottle up to make sure you keep. Because again, it's not just about winning the war, it's about securing the peace of high, inclusive, sustainable growth. And we have lots of silver linings. Um, we have, we leapfrogging in terms of medical innovations and inventions. That's great for, for this and future generation. It's great for the developing world. We are seeing a lot more interactions among the private sector across borders, even though governments are not doing that. That is exciting. 
we are seeing also much greater respect for professions. We are seeing great acts of caring. To the extent that we can bottle that up and have it also in the next phase, then this crisis would, would leave us with something very positive long-term and not just with the negative. That's a very good way to put it. I would add another silver lining to that list, which is we've all learned, we all had a crash course, accelerated crash course in using technology and discovering what it can and can't do, um, and even working out how to plug our computers in or laptops in sometimes. But um, Yeah, and we care much more about tail risks. We've understood what a tail risk looks like, so we can deal preferably, hopefully, with climate change. We've also have been confronted with a crisis that worsens not just the inequality of income and wealth, but worsens the inequality of opportunities. That is why you're hearing people outside your window. And I think that it's about time that we deal with especially the inequality of opportunity, income and wealth also, but opportunity is absolutely critical. Yeah, my teenage daughter has learned to time the times that she goes for walks with her friends to try and avoid the protests. And she's literally asking the policeman each day if she knows what time the protests are happening so that she can basically work out when the roads will be open. Um, you know, who would have guessed in 2020? But um, on the issue of climate change, we've had a number of questions about climate change. Um, I'm curious to ask both of you whether you think that what's happened is going to derail focus on climate change or actually increase focus on climate change afterwards. And I think that China's perspective on this, Ambassador Balkas, is particularly interesting. Um, but before I turn to you, I'll quickly ask Mohammed first, what is your view about what this means for climate change issues and the wider world of ESG going forward? So my hope is it will increase. It's certainly increasing on the corporate sector. It's the governments that I worry more about. Um, my worry is that people's attention will, will be diverted um, in, in a lasting manner away from sustainability. And I think that it is people that are watching us. It is ultimately the pressure that comes from underneath and that's put on governments. I think the corporate sector has embraced ESG in, 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 a, in, a, in a lasting manner, which is it's the governments needing to embrace climate change challenges more forcefully. I might uh, add to that. Um, when I was over in Beijing, uh, one of the most proud moments uh, was working with uh, President Xi Jinping on addressing climate change. When I started out <laughs> talking to him and other leaders, it was like talking to a fence post. Nothing. <laughs> After a while, I see a glimmer of hope, glimmer of interest. In, and um, they then, as you know, agreed with President Obama to a, to a national accord, President um, uh, she saw an opportunity to be on the stage with uh, President Obama, world leader. There's also an opportunity for China to push back against the troglodytes, the, the non-reformers in China. I mean, he could, and he did that. He said, "No, you, well, if we we have to join this climate change agreement, then that means some, some of your interest, industries have to reform and you have to be more efficient and address climate change." And it was very unfortunate when President Trump withdrew from the Paris Accord. I think that if the United States um, were to uh, re-enter the, the Accord, it sent a huge positive signal um, worldwide. Um, the United States is, still is, in many respects, the world leader. And people look to see what the United States does. When I, in China, Chinese people, like Americans, off the, the beacon on the hill, freedom, opportunity, democracy. They like America. And I, I think uh, if the United States lives up to its, its um, billing, um, does what it should do, lead, climate is one, um, not withdraw from WTO, not withdraw from WHO, but rather lead and get other countries involved, it will make a long, we'd go a long, long way. And if Biden's elected president, and he clearly will want to work with our allies. He wanted, his inclination is to, is to work with people, not against people, not be a bomb thrower, but rather uh, to find, find so, so if all that starts to happen, I think it'll address the better, the angels of human instinct. No, I don't want to take too much time here, but there are, and I was in the Congress, and it's clear to me, there are about 20, 30, 40, maybe 60, 70% of people are really good and they want to find solutions. 
You got a lot of crazies over in the far right, and you got a lot of crazies over in the far left. Forget them. You can't deal with them. You guys, but the 67% who really want to do the right thing, build bridges, find ways, common solutions, and we're going to start addressing some of this because that fiscal will be better, and we may even find decent climate policy. Well, I must say, I think a lot of people listening here, here right now, Ambassador Balkas, would say, we wish you were still in the Senate doing this and, you know, in a leadership position. And at the age of 78, um, that certainly doesn't in any way rule you out, given the current um, playing mm -hmm. field. So <laughs> who knows? You never know. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. But um, we have a couple of great questions from Mark Zeshin. Um, which perhaps are more for Mohammed. One is, should we expect to see negative rates in America? And secondly, will the U.S. Fed and Treasury be completely intertwined in the future? Great questions. On negative rates, I don't think so. And if we get there, it will mean bad news, not just on what's happening in the economy, but also on prospects. So let's hope we don't get there. Um, the experience with negative rates out of Europe suggests that the cost and risks exceed the benefits. On um, the Fed and, and um, the Treasury, you know, the irony of, of, this, of this crisis, one of the ironies is going into it, there were two theories out there that some people were talking about and too many people were dismissing. One was universal basic income, and the other one was modern monetary theory. Well, we've done both, and we've done both, and now everybody's trying to catch up to what it implies when you do both, and what's next. We've done UBI in terms of sending checks to people, irrespective of whether they're working or not working. We did that in the United States. A $1,200 check appeared in the mail for people earning below a certain level. Whether they were employed or not, it didn't matter. And then on the modern monetary theory, which is the, the answer of merging together the Treasury and the Fed, we're doing quite a bit of it already. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how all this evolves. But clearly, central banks are going to make it as easy as possible to, for governments to borrow and to borrow at low interest rates. For the rest of us, it's mean li living with financial repression and the consequences of financial repression. Um, well, I'd like to follow, ask two follow-up questions on that point, unless you have something which you strongly want to comment on, on that, Ambassador Balkas. I know. I, I'm, I'm, frankly, yeah. I'm fascinated listening to Mohammed <laughs> addressing well, there's two, there's two, two great questions. There's two great interlinked questions here. One is from M.T. Mays, who has asked, the real escape from the Depression in the 1930s in the U.S. was World War and the inflationary period that coincided with it, what will be the war that pulls economies out over the employment consumption hurdle? And there's also a great question earlier on from Stu. And I should, by the way, say that everyone who's asked questions, um, I should say they've been some of the smartest questions I've seen, and we've got a huge number of them. So apologies for not getting, getting to all of them. But we also have a great interlinked question from Stuart King, which is current government policy seems certain to crowd out productive investment how much lower is trend growth going to be as a result once we emerge from the immediate crisis? Mohammed, do you want to try and address those two together? So let me deal with Stuart King's um, question first. Um, Stuart, I don't think it's crowding out as yet because what, what is inhibiting private production, private activity um, is not government policy, it's other things. It's the ability to interact in, in the economy safely. And you see this both in terms of households and businesses. When Apple closes its stores in Houston, as it announced last night, it's not doing it because it's being crowded out. So I don't think that's the case. Um, the real problem is that government policy is not crowding in uh, private activities enough. That, that is the problem, and that is where one has to focus. On the first one, I do hope it, it, is, we, it is a war against poverty that triggers um, the right policy response. But I will leave that, the geopolitical side, to Ambassador Bacchus, who's much better placed than I am to talk about it. Ambassador, we're almost out of time, but just briefly, um, should we expect a war to pull us out of this? 
Well, um, you know, I've often thought that nothing really important happens in Washington, D.C. Um, basically, it's, it's kind of a maintenance operation, unless there's a real crisis. Uh, World War II was a crisis, you know, Pearl Harbor, Sputnik, New Deal, their crisis. And during a crisis, Washington, D.C. comes together and we tend to solve problems. We are facing a much, much more subtle, more abstract crisis. I don't know that's crystallized enough yet uh, to galvanize our country to, to the kind of crisis that we face in the past. We're moving in that direction, clearly. And I think COVID's kind of helping accelerate it. But I don't think we're quite there yet. Well, thank you both very much indeed. It's been an incredibly wide-ranging discussion. Um, if I had to summarize it, I'd say that the good news is that you're both agreed that governments seem committed at the moment to doing things to try and combat the slump um, to quite a dramatic degree. Um, we know we are expecting to see more monetary policy. We're expecting to see more stimulus action. The bad news is we're not convinced it's necessarily the right things entirely, even if it's inevitable at the moment or that it's going to actually bring about any rapid resolution to these incredibly difficult challenges. And perhaps the even worse bit of news is that in many ways, the real bill for these extraordinary policy measures is yet to come. And we don't know how leadership is going to respond to this. But lots of food for thought for anyone who's involved in the markets. Lots of food for thought for anyone trying to simply make sense of the world or live as a better citizen. So. On behalf of the Financial Times, um, I'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's been watching. Um, thank you to the audience for coming out with such incredible questions, an absolute explosion of questions. And I do apologize for not being able to get to them all. Do please keep reading the FT for this debate. Do please follow it, keep following the Greenwich Economic Forum as well. Um, and thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. <laughs>